When does an offshore wind farm create economic value for its developers? How would you measure and model such value anyway? What do you need for a good site? Why are people building or investigating development opportunities in some places, but not others? If you're curious about such things, but new to offshore wind energy, or to project equity cash flow modelling, or both, this detailed but accessible First Pathway course explores these very questions. And other questions like, while there are credible estimates of site-specific wind speed data freely available in the public domain, can we somehow use them to feed a cash flow model? How much do today's big utility-scale offshore wind farms cost to build, operate and remove? How can you assess competing development options when there are uncertainties and lots of moving parts? These and more are covered in what we are proud to present as Offshore Wind Economics for Complete Beginners, an online, self-contained and self-paced hands-on course for those thinking about a future in the commercial side of offshore wind based on Excel case studies and preparatory exercises with solved and unsolved versions. Approximately 11 hours of wide-ranging, often conversational video lectures, averaging around three to four minutes each, and various quizzes, tangents, and the odd joke. If you're time pressed, by the way, you can find a two minute tour video and a lot more detail on this page. Anyway, this is a much expanded and polished version 2.0 of a successful pilot given in late 2020. This updated version has five units. The first four all somehow prepare you to apply what you've learned in unit five. We'll talk a bit about these soon, but first, pardon our manners, we've not even been introduced. I'm Gavin Smart, Head of Analysis and Insights at Offshore Renewable Energy Catapult. In my day job, I and my technical colleagues are, well, in the thick of lots of cross-disciplinary studies on both established and emerging technologies in offshore wind, in which I've been working on the valuation side since 2010. I lead a team of financial and strategy analysts, and I'm responsible for economic modelling. I've also co-written a number of reports for the International Energy Agency, with a focus on costs. I'm Ken Casriel. I don't have any drone footage of my own, but like Gavin, I'm an energy economist, Big Four alumnus, and project valuations practitioner in a capital-intensive segment. In this case, I'm from across the industry divide, so to speak, having worked in upstream oil and gas valuation in 27 jurisdictions since 1995. I also like teaching. I'm the co-author of a Wiley Finance newbie-targeted textbook, which has been adopted at 21 U.S. universities and colleges. Now, I'm not trying to sell this book. We have other, more interesting fish to fry, but I'm proud that reviewers say that I'm good at breaking things down for laymen. I try to, whether they're readers. Or students, like the non-economists I've taught at the MSc level, at the IFP school in France, and this course, given in collaboration with energy consultants ERCE at Royal Holloway University in the UK. Kind of like Gavin and myself, our two industries' economics are similar-ish, though different enough to make things really interesting. He's been both infinitely patient with my many questions and quite open to suggestions in our nearly two-year collaboration, which has not been without occasional good-natured differences in perspective.
well, all part of a team effort, eh? As for the course itself, you'll explore this question by way of a world tour of offshore wind from 100,000 feet or so. If you guess that you need places with a lot of fast wind, well, you're certainly right there. But how fast is fast? You'll see how that's quantified on an annual basis by way of recognisable patterns or distributions. Here, each set of coloured bars shows how many hours the wind blew at what speed over the course of the year. The speeds are shown in both metres per second and miles per hour here. Each colour totals to the 8,760 hours in 2018, which was not a leap year. The more the shape oozes to the right over the higher wind speeds, as with the light blue bars here, the better for generation. Beyond wind speed, using the early 2020s commercially viable technology, which is now proven at the utility scale, we run into constraints, like distance from shore and water depth. We explore the technology, both established and emerging, helping the industry tackle these challenges. To make it easier to eyeball these factors of wind, distance and water depth, we joined forces with environmental consultancy firm Aquaterra to make a custom global offshore wind map for this course. For example, in the Polish Baltic Sea, the windy enough areas here are colored. And if there are no diagonal lines, it means the area is shallow enough for today's proven at the utility scale offshore wind technology, which uses turbines that are planted into the seabed. This is where developments are planned. It's kind of neat, and you'll see many other examples of this. The map makes for a really useful lens in this unit's selective world tour of current and planned activity. Things you'll notice both in the lectures and by zooming around on your own on the map, which all enrolled students can download, are 1. That while offshore wind is renewable, the presently technically viable areas available for development are finite using today's commercial scale proven fixed bottom tech. And 2. Like oil and gas, exploitable wind resources aren't distributed equally globally, not at all. There are other considerations too. Some folks welcome the industry's growth into new areas with open arms. But is there supporting infrastructure in place, like manufacturing and big specialised ports and other facilities? These take time and money to get into place, and until they are, there will be some reliance on imported kit. On the other hand, not everyone welcomes the industry in their area. You'll see, in fact, in our Unit 5 case study, how local stakeholder opposition creates obstacles to your proposed wind farm development, but which also creates interesting options to consider. There's also the question of the local grid's readiness to handle the challenges of intermittent power sources like offshore wind. Unit 2 is where the journey to estimating offshore wind farm sales revenue starts, at the single turbine level. It's also the first unit where you fire up Excel in earnest. We saw earlier that wind speeds follow patterns or distributions. What's really handy is that if you know a place's annual mean or average wind speed, something you can find credibly estimated online, it's not hard to then estimate these curves reasonably accurately on your own for a given site. Zooming out a bit, when that wind passes through a turbine, it generates different amounts of power at different wind speeds. Within boundaries, the faster the wind, the higher the instantaneous generation. That's shown by the red line in the top chart. The resultant annual generation itself is what you see in the bottom chart with the total for the year shown as the label at the end of the black line, here in kilowatt hours. And suddenly, we have a basis for simulating single turbine gross revenue. In fact, you'll be given two sites and several turbine models to work out which ones produce the most energy at different sites. 
these beauty contest winners will end up feeding the Unit 5 case study model, where, after some adjustments, it will ultimately drive annual revenue. Now, this might look like a lot at first, but we take things step by step. No background in statistics is required. You don't need to be a hardcore left-brainer, honest. Take it from me, I started out as a journalist, not an analyst. More like one of these types. Now, for the course, you can't be a complete hippie. An analytical bent and curiosity will serve you well. Ultimately, though, this stuff is quite doable and interesting enough to be worth it. One of the keys, I find, is to break down technical content into small bits. For the next short stretch, if you'd please keep your eyes on the left of this view from the course player, you'll see that we cover a lot of ground, but break things down into short, brain-sized nuggets. There are no long, eye-glazing lectures. You'll see that throughout the approximately 11 hours of video content, they average around three or four minutes each. This makes it easier to dip in and out of, too. You'll also learn here and in other units by doing. You'll get hands-on with both easy and hard versions of exercises, including, of course, the solution files, so you'll always have a check. You'll see this learning approach again in Unit 3, where we tackle basic cash flow and valuation modeling. We base our valuations on forecast future net cash flow. That's just all your cash coming in minus all your cash going out. So here it's the black line, which is the green minus the red. Inflows are revenue from generation. Outflows are the costs of things like setting up the wind farm, generation running costs, tax, and at the end, decommissioning, which is dismantling and restoring the site when you're done. In this unit, we purposefully start with a small simplified model with a shorter project lifespan from planning to decommissioning than the 35 years for the wind farms in the full Unit 5 case study. And we leave out, for now, also other wind realistic details. This lets us focus here in a tidy space, just on the main generic economic concepts and coding in Excel. This includes a technique for easily simulating delays which aren't uncommon in big, complex projects like offshore wind farms, and applying what's known as discounting to our cash flows. Discounting can be kind of a wet towel. Makes a, a bit of a difference. And unfortunately, we can't ignore this because when you add up each year's forecasted future discounted NCF, you get what's called net present value, or NPV. NPV is pretty foundational to modern finance theory and is how we measure project economic value in this course. You'll be guided through the intuition behind why we discount and a method which lets you shine a light on NPV's components in a way which Excel's black box NPV function doesn't. This comes in handy when, even to experienced analysts, NPV acts counterintuitively, and you're left to explain why. And again, if you've never put something like this together before, you're fully guided and strapped in, as it were. Every row of Excel code is explained. It's more basic logic than advanced maths. And we'll get this sorted. Unit 4 veers away from generic economic concepts and coding with a return to offshore wind specifics. First, you'll get walked through the premises of our Unit 5 case study. For this and the other units, you can find more detail in a longer drill down video on the course's public homepage. For now, at a high level, you're a developer trying to decide which, if any, of a number of options for development off the coast of a fictitious country make economic sense. The options vary in different ways. You're already prepared to process some of them. For example, the two possible sites within the same license area have different mean wind speeds. You'll already know how to quantify the impact on gross 
single turbine annual electricity production, or AEP, because, well, you've done it. These were the same mean wind speeds you used to pick the best turbines in Unit 2. The cases also differ in timing, as local stakeholders worried about the impact on tourism, which is important to the local economy, of what some might find to be spoiled beach views from turbines visible from 40 kilometres away. They win an injunction to stop all your development work. They'll relent if you agree to move further from shore. If not, you can always fight them in court. But who knows how long that will take? But you can account for this because you already saw how to model delays in Unit 3. Then comes some new stuff. There are impacts on cost to consider, which Gavin expertly guides you through. And these come from, among other things, different distances from shore. The winds are higher as you move further from shore in this case, but so are the construction and running costs. The sites also have different water depths, which impact costs too. As does whether you'll be building your one gigawatt wind farm, and that figure will be meaningful to you by this point in the course, by the way, from many small turbines or fewer big ones. Personally, I wouldn't have a clue where to begin to account for the cost impacts of these. Long story short, in around two hours of easy-to-follow lectures, Gavin walks you through the assumptions and the thinking behind every one of this entire stack of costs for each option. You'll also get a sense of the sheer scale of some of this kit. Including the bits you don't normally see all of, like foundations. Things all come together in Unit 5's case study model. If this looks familiar from what we've already seen of Unit 3, it's because in most respects, the modelling here is the very same that you saw in the more accessible introductory mini-models, only now writ large with a wind-realistic time frame and detailed inputs, thanks to Unit 4. You'll find we've set things up to ease comparisons between different options, for example, here, looking at how and why one's option's end result, i.e. its total discounted cash flow, differs from that of another option, so you can understand why one result is better than another. Unit 5 also completes the rest of the wind-relevant concepts and coding used in the case study model, with sections covering tariffs, or the power price your project receives, what are known as power losses, which are used to adjust gross generation to net generation for the whole farm. And an important metric, the levelized cost of energy, or LCOE. You'll find the model well signposted and navigable. If you insist, you can download and jump into this model right at the start. But just read the model's README material and sell comments before you do. There are also exercises designed to get you up on two wheels and comfortable with playing with inputs. As usual, we take things step by step at the risk of exhausting this metaphor. So, you'll see that we've really just covered the bare bones in this overview which can't do full justice to all the material in the course. So, if you're thinking about a career in offshore wind energy, or if you're an employer looking to help get new, specialisable, but not yet specialised staff off to a good start, or are just curious, visit us at ore-catapult-school.thinkific.com, where you'll find more including a downloadable description and detailed table of contents, student reviews, video summaries of each of the five units, which drill down a bit more than we do here, and some free sample lectures, which we'll be adding over time. What's holding you back?